welcome to eCancer. Uh, we have fresh news from ASCO, and I'm very happy to discuss some of the main topics with uh, Dr. Spira, uh, Virginia Cancer Specialist. I'm Benjamin Bess. I'm a thoracic oncologist at uh, Gustave Roussy near Paris, France. So we might start with uh, the plenary session. Uh, Lung was at the plenary session this year with uh, the adjuvant study ADORA. Uh, as you know, uh, in Caucasian patients, around 10% have EGFR uh, mutation, and it's uh, around 50% in the Asian population. So one of the big questions was, could an EGFR TKI impact the outcome in the adjuvant setting when these patients have resected non-small cell lung cancer? So the other was randomizing three years of ozimertinib versus placebo in uh, uh, 682 patients, and the outcome is quite impressive, but the primary income is DFS on the stage two and stage three, as that ratio was 0.17, which is very, very profound. There are a, 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 a snapshot on the overall survival, but it's clearly uh, uh, too soon to have any data on overall survival. So. Uh, the study is clearly positive regarding its positive is the primary endpoint and all the discussion around is um, is DFS a relevant endpoint in the adjuvant setting or should we wait for OS because what we want to do in the adjuvant setting is cure more. What do you think, Alex? That's a great question, Ben, and I think you know everybody's going to be debating this until we get the final overall survival statistics, but clearly the question is, what do we do now for our patients? Uh, I mean, the DFS was beyond oppressive with a hazard ratio that may never have been seen before in the lung cancer scenario. I think there are some criticisms, and they're mild criticisms, that you know the use of adjuvant chemotherapy was not 100% clear or stratified. That being said, I think the DFS was so profound, and given the trend to OS, I think in my mind, and I think in most people's minds, we'll move those stage two, three patients resected to getting you know three years of adjuvant osimertinib. Uh, you know, this is a tough population. Not everybody who relapses will even be able to get therapy. And certainly, talking to patients about the fact that you're preventing their disease from relapsing is an important outcome. We might be wrong, and we've been wrong before. And I think. We've all, we all agree that overall survival should be the ultimate endpoint in an adjuvant study because ultimately that's what it is. But I think these statistics were so profound, we have to move forward with this. Uh, you know, some may agree, some may want to wait for more, but I think overall, especially given the fact that it's a relatively low toxicity drug, it is an oral drug, I think here in the United States, the biggest concern will be financial toxicity because it's not a cheap drug. There's also obviously other questions, and do you really need three years? Is two years? Do you need five? Do you need it indefinitely? Like we treat uh, uh, CML patients. They're on TKIs lifelong, obviously a different scenario. So there's a lot more questions we'll get some answers to. Some we never will be, and some will be debated. But I do think this is practice changing as of now. And there was this, uh, to put the data into perspective, it was very interesting to see uh, the update of the Sitong study. So it's one adjuvant study in China that compared binaurelbin cisplatin to jafetinib. And the fact is that the DFS at three years is positive. It was the primary endpoint, and it, it's only a, a study in stage three, so it's partially overlapped at ORA. But uh, when you look at uh, OS, because we have much more follow-up for this study, well, there is absolutely no sign of benefit in OS. And this is something we have already seen. Well, if you take the metastatic setting and the optimal study, uh, it was a, 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 a TKI, first generation TKI against chemotherapy. I know this is metastatic setting, but just to give a perspective to the audience, the hazard ratio was 0.16 for the PFS. So you really think it will impact the OS with these metastatic patients. And in fact, the impact for OS was 0.21. It's just that I agree with you that so far this is the data that we have, but we really have to take a step back and wait for uh, more results to see if it does impact OS. Another exciting time uh, for uh, targets is exon 20 EGFR mutation. It's a rare mutation, 
around 1% of all our patients, probably less than 10% of EGFR mutation. And so far, the activity of the TKIs in this uh, subgroup of patients was debated, and a new drug, amivantamab, is uh, as a completely different mechanism of action, it's a uh, uh, B-specific antibody against EGFR and MET. And we have seen very interesting results from a phase two study in this subgroup of patients, so patients with exon 20 EGFR mutation, with a response rate of 36% and a PFS of 0.3 months in pretreated patients. Alex, what is your view on that study? So, you know, amivantamab is an, is an interesting molecule. I mean, in the, as you pointed out, Ben, the EGFR exon 20 mutated space has become actually somewhat complicated, right? There's at least two or three drugs presented at ASCO this year that are all shown promise. And this one is unique because it's a monoclonal antibody. And we haven't really talked about monoclonals in the EGFR lung cancer mutated space, although there is an approval, you know, for colorectal cancer for a long time. You know, it's going to be very difficult to tease all these different drugs together, but amivantamib has been a very exciting drug. It appears to have response rates that are higher than some of the other TKIs. Uh, it appears to be well tolerated, and this is a very well done study. Uh, uh, you know, for the first time, we're going to have drugs that target this molecule, and I think we all expect that within 12 months, there's probably going to be commercially available options. Um, given the relatively good tolerability, given the lack of other options, if you look at this study, there was a clinical benefit rate uh, that was 67% uh, uh, and up to 72% for patients who had platinum-based therapy, which is pretty remarkable for this uh, area. Major toxicities as expected for EGFR are rash related, uh, which is a little bit of a throwback to the older EGFR molecules that we don't use as much anymore. But I do think this is beyond promising. It's going to be interesting to see it plays out because it's been a very uh, complicated area with multiple different entries into this field. So we're probably not going to know which one is better uh, because obviously they're going not going to be compared head to head as they you know reach market. But it's super exciting and patients need to be found for these studies. We need to be testing for EGFR exon 20 insertion, which is a big challenge. Um, but I think as we do that and get these options, it's going to be a game changer for these patients. And it should be reminded that uh, we both co-authors the abstract and uh, that there are other interesting drugs, in particular TKIs. There was an update on uh, TAC-788, uh, uh, which is an oral compound with a, a response rate of 43%. Posiotinib was also updated with probably more toxicity and response rate a bit uh, different so far. And it would be very interesting to see how these different drugs uh, will uh, uh, be either complementary or either compete in this setting. In, you know, Ben, in terms of novel drug development, I hate to say it was almost the year of Exxon 20 because we had updated data on posiotinib. Uh, posiotinib has been a little disappointing because the response rates haven't kept up with where they initially were, but we have updates on TAC-788. We have high-dose osimertinib, which actually was surprisingly, although in a small study, some interesting response rates, uh, as well as the monoclonal antibody, evimatinib. So it's going to be a very complicated area and exciting. Again, another new novel target. It's probably important to recall that uh, for exon 20 mutation, all the mutations are not similar. Uh, compared to the classical activating mutation, exon 19 or exon 21, where it's very, uh, let's say, homogeneous, uh, mutation in exon 20 are very heterogeneous. And it might explain, I mean, the molecular uh, analysis might explain why sometimes some drugs are more active than, than others. It will be very interesting to see if this is the case for uh, Anivantana. I think the only other thing is we're also used to such high response rates to osimertinib in regular EGFR. I don't want to say regular, but an EGFR mutated. And I think across the board, the Exxon 20 drugs are probably not going to be as good. Still going to be great options. These drugs also have more side effects. And we've gotten so lulled into the fact that osimertinib is such a good drug. Um, this is going to be a little bit different. Exciting, but different. The last abstract we would like to discuss is a very interesting one uh, from FDA. 
it's been quite new that LVA is able to uh, reanalyze their own data set, mainly from randomized trial, and they did that for 10 trials uh, that tested single agent immunotherapy. So they had compared in all these trials that could be either in first line or is second line, how uh, PDL1 expression could impact um, the outcome in the subset of patients that had high PDL1 expression. And when we say high, we say PDL1 percentage in more than 50% of the tumor cells. And it's been quite interesting to see that if you compare the outcome of the very, very high PDL1 expression, meaning more than 90% of the tumor cells that are stained, um, uh, the outcome is much better either in terms of PFS or OS, first line or second line. As an example, the hazard ratio for PFS in first line is 0.78. When you compare the very high PDL1 to the uh, uh, PDL1, uh, 50 to 90, uh, 89%. So it might fuel the debate of what is optimal in first line. Should we use always single agent immunotherapy? Should we use immunotherapy plus, immuno plus chemotherapy or immuno plus immuno in the near future? What do you think, Alex? So this is, you know, as you said, Ben, an interesting thought, and it kind of echoes what we've known all along that while we've put PDL scores in the less than one, one to 49, greater than 50 basket, it's a spectrum and not a cutoff. And I think that what this tells us is that the higher you are, the more likely you are to respond to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And that ultimately has the implication, what do you do in first line? Do you give somebody triplet therapy? Uh, we can debate whether or not triplet therapy, given some of the new data as well, that's a separate discussion, right? Uh, but whether or not, for example, you give somebody carbopem pembro or would you give pembro alone? And I think there's data here that the higher PDL you are, the closer you are to 100, you're probably more likely, and this is as expected, right, that you're more likely to respond to single agent checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Uh, that obviously needs to be debated. Are there patients that you don't think are gonna get the second line? Are there patients going to need a response, need to throw everything at them? But if you're looking at somebody, maybe they're older, maybe they can't do chemo, maybe they're asymptomatic, and their PDL score is very high, 90 to 100%, I think this can justify, and you could have justified it before, but now with more ammunition, whether or not you can give them single agent pembrolizumab therapy rather than triplet therapy. So I think it enhances some of that. How that applies to some of the newer data, obviously nivolumab uh, is now part, maybe part of for some people, should be part of for a lot of people, first line therapy. Uh, I don't think we have time to go into that right now, but I think as you look at single agent checkpoint inhibitor therapy, you know, this is, is again, more data to say that it's okay to give, especially in very high PDL patients. I agree, we have to learn more about the phenotypes of these patients that could not derive a benefit from single agent immunotherapy. Maybe high tumor burden, uh, maybe aggressive disease, uh, rapid doubling times. This is probably also a factor that we will have to analyze in the future to uh, discriminate IO, IOIO, or IO chemotherapy, but uh, exactly time, exciting times to come. Alex, have you heard anything exciting about liquid biopsy? So I don't know if I've heard anything exciting and, or new, but I think the exciting thing at ASCO this year has been all the new targeted therapies. You know, we have new CMET drugs, we have new RET drugs, uh, we have new EGFR drugs. And I think the take home message has to be is making sure we're checking all of our patients. Part of that is liquid biopsies. You know, you may not be able to get a test, you may not have enough tissue, and I think there's adequate data to say, now for a long time that by whatever means necessary, we should be interrogating our tumor for all the appropriate mutations. And liquid biopsies, which have really come a long way, are an intricate part of that. Uh, you can argue whether or not they should be done on everybody or not. Part of it is a timing issue, right? You know, somebody walks in, you want all your data so the patient can start on therapy and of course be less anxious. But I do think they have a clear role. There's also a role now in patients of progression. If you look at some of the newer molecules, we know that there are secondary resistance mutations and picking that up while you can do a second biopsy is also easily done on a liquid biopsy. So, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time and never, you know, uh, it continues to be that we need to keep looking for these actionable mutations, again, by whatever means necessary. I agree. Uh, liquid biopsy is now a completely accepted tool. It's used to screen 
the molecular abnormality to screen resistance. And I think at ASCO, there was some uh, fine tuning of, around, could it be a predictive uh, uh, marker uh, in uh, reflecting, for example, the tumor burden with the allele frequency? Uh, is the dynamic evolution of CPDNA in the blood after a few cycles could predict the benefit? I think we will fine tune this for the use of the liquid biopsy. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention listening to this uh, e-cancer expert-to-expert discussion. Mm -hmm.